And let's talk about the best books I read in 2022. So let's begin with the um, category of classical literature. Uh, in this uh, category, I have three books. All three books that I read in this category, I've read in Russian language, uh, simply because they're either originally written in Russian and there is no point for me to read a translated work, or they were uh, they were written in uh, some other language that I wouldn't understand in original, for example, ancient Greek or uh, Spanish, and that for me it doesn't make sense to read it in English translation when I can pick like a Russian translation. And the first mention, and actually I think one of the first books that I've read in 2022, it was in January, it's uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. Obviously you can see here this is the Russian edition, and oh my god, I loved it so much. Um, and I think I mentioned in one of the videos um, that I recorded last year, um, it is so great. I loved it very much and I think I recommend it to everybody. I have to admit it's rather difficult to read, um, partially because there are a lot of uh, characters with the same name. I think People can overcome that maybe by like drawing schemes of the characters. This is what I did. I think after reading Pachinko uh, by Min Jin Lee um, in 2021, I wanted to pick another family saga. And obviously the first choice, if you want to read family saga, is 100 Years of Solitude. And that was, I think, the right choice. And I'm glad that I read it. I recommend it to everybody. So yeah. The uh, second book in this category that I'm proud of reading is The Odyssey by Homer. Again, I read in Russian. Uh, it is actually quite a nice translation. Uh, it is with the rhymes and uh, with a nice rhythm. Uh, so I uh, liked it because finally I've read the original story, let's say. So we all know the um, the Odyssey, we know uh, all the movies that are made based on the story and TV shows and uh, um, other fictional works uh, such as, for example, uh, Madeline Miller. And I enjoyed it because finally I read the original. Uh, finally, I know how Homer originally structured the story and uh, now I understand better all the retellings, all the interpretations of this classical work. So I can't say that I'm like a big fan of ancient Greece and Greek mythology. Uh, I appreciate it really much and I have to understand it if uh, if I want to be like art historian, right? I think it's kind of an achievement also to finally read these uh, very old classical work. Uh, so I liked it about like myself. I like that I read this book and that's why it's one of my favorite. And the last best classical work I've read in 2022 is The Adolescent by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Now, hear me out. Uh, I've read uh, Karamazov Brothers, or Brothers, Brothers Karamazov, I think it's uh, called in English, uh, and The Adolescent in 2022. Uh, I have to admit, Brothers Karamazov, this legendary novel, is really great, don't get me wrong, but I find it's too difficult uh, because it's just, it's really long. There are a lot of philosophy, religious philosophy, I would say, and um, I'm not sure if I got the uh, the point. So, for example, when I read War and Peace, that was a, such a joyous experience to, um, to see Tolstoy's view on uh, philosophy of history absolutely great, very accessible, yes, repetitive, but I think that um, makes his point even stronger. And in Dostoevsky's case, it's just very perplexing, which again, it can be, um, I guess, interesting if you like really see it and maybe reread this book. Um, maybe I will try it someday, maybe I'll read it, uh, Brothers Karamazov, and I will enjoy it in a new way. But in case of The Adolescent, I find that it is just pure Dostoevsky scandal, you know. So he has this basic story, uh, which is also very, you know, perplexing. It has uh, different sides of the story and uh, you not revealed um, everything 
uh, from the start, you actually like reveal the story together with the main character uh, or side characters. So the same thing happens in uh, Brothers Karamazov. And in the adolescent, he doesn't have this, you know, heavy, uh, hardcore philosophy. He just has this story, which is intriguing, scandalous, and at the same time, very tragic. There are a lot of intakes on suicide, and uh, I think it is very also interesting to see how characters behave around this topic. So again, uh, the adolescent is not as difficult and is not as hardcore as uh, Brothers Karamazov, but it still has this Dostoevsky fleur, and uh, I really enjoyed that. And I think so far it is um, my favorite book by Dostoevsky. A long time ago, I DNF'd The Crime and Punishment, so maybe Crime and Punishment would be my favorite one if I read it right now. Uh, maybe I was too young at that time, but yes. So, so far so good. I really enjoyed that, but it's just my personal opinion that The Adolescent was just more, um, more enjoyable read for me. So yeah, let's move on to uh, contemporary literature. <laughs> um, the first one, I have to admit, obviously, that Circe by Madeline Miller was a great literary experience. Um, so I first read, obviously, the Song of Achilles. I really enjoyed that too. However, uh, I think for me personally, Circe is just more relatable. Uh, and that's why I enjoy that more. Um, so yeah, it is... Uh, such a great intake on the character who is almost invisible in the Odyssey of Homer or uh, in all the movies um, that are like about the Odyssey. And uh, I really enjoyed her interpretation or her new retelling of her story. I really liked it. She obviously incorporated a lot of Greek mythology into this one story. And oh my gosh, she's so talented in exploiting those myths and mythological characters, so I really enjoy that. And it's such a pleasure when you read and when you recognize the characters and you're like, oh yeah, uh, that guy or that character, I know them, but I know them from this different perspective uh, or from like this classical mythological perspective. And here they're interpreted in different ways. I know everybody enjoys the Song of Achilles um, by the same author, Madeline Miller, which I uh, do enjoy too, but it's just that story seems a little bit more curated. Uh, she carefully selected uh, all the characters, whilst in Circe, I think she uh, took a little bit more freedom and um, she included everybody she wanted. That's what I felt and that's why I enjoyed it more. That one, uh, the first contemporary literary work that I enjoyed in the previous year and the next one is uh, Flights by Olga Tokarczuk. Uh, Olga Tokarczuk took a Nobel Prize in Literature in 2018. Uh, she's originally from Poland and uh, it's been a while since I wanted to uh, read her works. Finally, I did that in the uh, previous year, in 2022, and I selected Flights and oh my god, that was such a great artistic experience, let's say. So what she does in this book is she combines fictional and non-fictional stories all together, um, historical facts maybe, or like scientific facts, and she incorporates them in this wonderful map of situations and moments in life where um, we must think about our body in space and time or maybe some parts of the body. And I really enjoyed that. And some of the uh, observations are so keen, I would say. Uh, I think Olga Tokarczuk is not just a great author and writer, but also a great observant. And this is what I really appreciate about her and her writing. Uh, I really, I usually don't do that, but I want to read um, one of the things that I underline here. In the last few years, she had realized that all you have to do to become invisible is to be a woman of a certain age without any outstanding features. It is automatic, not only invisible to men, but also to women who no longer treat her as competition in anything. It is a new and surprising sensation how people's eyes just sort of float right over her face, her cheeks and her nose, not even skimming the surface. They look straight through her, no doubt looking past her at ads and landscapes and schedules. Oh, 
so good. And again, uh, I think she's just a great observant. And it was a great experience to see the world with her eyes. So I really recommend it. Um, the next section, I would say it's um, fictional history. And this is how I would define this category. Uh, so the first one, obviously, is The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia by Masha Gessen. Masha Gessen is born in Soviet Union and they moved to the United States. They immigrated uh, to the United States long, long time ago. They work at like different media rights for different magazines and newspapers. Uh, however, they also publish various books uh, on uh, history, modern history of Russia. So this one is, I think, the greatest work in journalistic, let's say, investigations. So what they did is that they took uh, various not fictional people and they told the history of modern Russia through the stories of these people, how these people grew up in last years of Soviet Union, what they became in uh, new Russia after the collapse of Soviet Union. Masha Gessen also exploited the psychoanalytical theory in order to see the nation through the psychoanalytical lens. And that is... I've never seen anybody do that. Uh, I have to admit, I'm have no idea about psychoanalysis and psychology of individuals, let alone the whole nations. But I really uh, enjoyed this idea that you can take the uh, common theories in psychology or psychoanalysis uh, and apply it into the story of a nation and the politics of nations. It opened my eyes on so many things and I really enjoy that. I uh, am really appreciative of their work. Uh, I think that Marsha Gessen is an extraordinary author and I think this is one of the authors that we should be, you know, watching uh, right now and seeing what they're doing. So yeah, uh, strongly recommended, especially if you're interested in uh, current politics uh, of Russia, if you want to understand what's going on and why such thing as war, for example, in Ukraine happened. And as I already said that in one of my previous videos, it's an extraordinary, uh, phenomenal work. And uh, I think everybody who's interested in that should read that. So yeah. <laughs> and the last um, historical fiction that I really enjoyed last year is The Paris Bookseller. So uh, last year, uh, me and my husband went to the honeymoon in Paris. There I went to the Shakespeare um, and Company bookstore the pretty famous one and there they had a stock of this uh, book the paris bookseller about the person who actually created the original bookstore uh, shakespeare and company the one that is uh, located now in paris is actually not in the original building and um not actually the original one and uh, the reason why you can actually learn in this book so this book tells the story of Sylvia Beach who moved to Paris in the at the end of 19th century, the beginning of 20th century, and opened there a bookstore of uh, English books. What is also fascinating about uh, this book and her story is that she helped uh, James Joyce to publish Ulysses. So basically the original Ulysses was published first in Paris in Shakespeare and Company. Nobody wanted to publish it, for example, in the States or um, the UK. Very good timing to read this book because last year, 2022, was 100 years of Ulysses. It was published in 1922. And uh, so that was a really great um, time for me to read this book. But no worries, I think you can read it in any year, any time. It's just a ultimately great story of a great woman uh, who's done a great job. Another interesting fact about uh, this particular book is that when I purchased it at Shakespeare and Company, they always ask you, like, do you want to have a stamp on your book? I said, yes, sure. So they put this little stamp on my book and yes, now I have it and it's so great. Now my last category is non-fictional books, just simple old-school non-fiction. And uh, here the one that I already mentioned in my non-fiction November results is Susan Zontag, Illness is Metaphor. 
No surprises here because I love Susan Zontag and I think her writing is very great, very accessible and philosophical at the same time. This is what we love in great literature, right? And I have so many notes. I had so many ideas and uh, I've learned a, a lot. I think she is also as Olga Tagarchuk or Olga Tagarchuk is just like Susan Zontag. They're really great observants and uh, they notice so many great things. So yeah. Loved it very much. The next one is, I think, pure joyous experience. Uh, and it's called Around the World in 80 Plants by Jonathan Drury. I love this book, first of all, because it's very interesting. It is a lot of interesting facts about plants um, and their cultural history, not only biological facts, right? And the second reason is... Um, why you should pick up the hard copy is the illustration by Lucille Clark. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. And that is just so great. So this is, for example, castor oil plant. Uh, beautiful flowers. Um, and it's just, it looks realistic, but at the same time artistic. And this is what I really love about this book. So yeah, I recommend it, uh, especially if you think about like giving a gift to a person who loves plants, who is interested in biology or gardening. Uh, I think that would be really great gift to somebody like that. And the last one uh, deserved to be mentioned is How We Die by Sherwin B. Newland. So um, the reason I picked that is actually after I read uh, Joanne Didion, she mentions this book in the Year of Magical Thinking, and I thought, yeah, I should check that out. And I really enjoy that. So Sherwin Nolan points out on the fact that sometimes we perceive death wrongly. So we expect uh, to death to be something, I don't know, something like a very dramatic point in your life uh, when you say your beautiful last words and then uh, you go out to this mystical um, afterlife world which is obviously not the case especially for some illnesses uh, this is a very difficult experience and it's not romantic at all and it's not beautiful at all i agree with the author and i think we should not be deceived by this romanticization of death that actually started already in medieval ages um, we uh, shall understand that in case of terminal illnesses and death there is nothing um, let's say beautiful and it can be actually very traumatic uh, for people around not just the person who experiences illness and death i think we should be you know very sober about it we should be very truthful about it and we should not again deceive ourselves by telling that everybody's going to be okay uh we should be ready to the worst and maybe it's some like pessimistic philosophy or something but i do believe that it actually helps uh, when you're ready to the worst, uh, when the worst comes, it's easy for you to overcome it. Uh, so, and I think um, we should all be prepared for that, uh, no matter our life stage, uh, no matter what's happening right now. These bad things might happen even to the healthy and the young. I really enjoyed this book because it made me think of all the difficult things that sometimes, you know, people just avoid talking and thinking about. So yeah, this is the um, list of the best books that I personally read in 2022. So you have to also keep in mind that if uh, these are my best books of 2022, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be best books of 2023. It's just I encountered them that year and I'm uh, really happy that I did. I'm really happy that I finally introduced to the works of these uh, great human beings. And now I... <laughs> I am obliged to mention a couple of books that were not that great. And the reason why I want to do that is that you will avoid them. <laughs> or maybe you'll see this video and you decide that I'm absolutely a tasteless person and know nothing about literature. And uh, you'll decide to check those worst, in my opinion, books. <laughs> Let's begin with, uh, yeah, the book that I read also in the beginning of 2022. And it is The Secret History by Donna Tart. Uh, I don't know what's this hype about. So obviously I picked it up just because people, a lot of people say that it's such a great literary work. You have to check that out. Um, I don't know. I like 
meh. So <laughs> I think I just had uh, so many great expectations about this book, but um, they were not satisfied. And the reason is why, why should I care about the story of very spoiled rich kids and the person who's trying to fit in this company and they're doing like questionable things. Again, nothing wrong with doing questionable things in the literature. If you write characters, it can be like as bad as possible. There are many examples when a person who is immoral, for example, doing his everyday stuff and doing his crimes, for example, in Crime and Punishment, and we all appreciate the demonstration of a human condition. However, in this book, there were no human condition. It was basically just spoiled kids doing some random stuff and pretending they're doing it because they understand something. <laughs> Again, maybe it's just because I'm not a rich kid in the um, high-tier university and don't get like Greek mythology or something. Maybe. But I understand that a lot of people enjoy nowadays this dark academia vibe and um, for some people maybe that's the reason why they love this book. Okay, great. You can pick that up, you can try it, but obviously that's just probably not my cup of tea. The next book that I not particularly enjoyed that year is uh, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism by Kristen uh, Godsey. I think I pronounced the name correctly. Um, so... I think that you have to read this book if you have no idea about feminism at all. If you're like absolute beginner, maybe you never heard about feminism. <laughs> uh, but if you like ever had any little thought on feminism and relationship between feminism and capitalism and our, let's say, any economical structure, that wouldn't be interesting for you. It was just very boring for me. And the reason is also because probably the target group of this book was, um, I don't know, average American woman. But then what's the point? We should not underestimate American women. They know exactly what they want, what they need. It's just uh, their government cannot provide it. But for the person who lives in Europe and uh, who was born in this former socialist country, I can't say I enjoy that. So yeah, I uh, can't recommend you if you're familiar with the feminist theory, any feminist theory at all uh, like that would not be any benefit to you. But yeah, maybe if you if you know nothing, maybe you can start with that. Yeah, why not? Another uh, book that actually also deals with, let's say, feminism, uh, masculinity, is uh, What Do Men Want by Nina Power. I got rid of the dust cover because I just like books without them. So yeah, but uh, it's actually a very uh, beautiful dust cover. So What Do Men Want by Nina Power. Um, <laughs> Please don't get me wrong. This is what, not one of those books like, oh, how to find a best husband or something like that. Uh, it's a question. It's a very sincere question uh, that Nina Power asks. What is the state of masculinity? What is the relationship between men and women nowadays? And what we should do about it? So I uh, first learned about this book in one of the philosophical telegram channels where they sometimes uh, announce new publications. And so basically this book was published in 2020. 22. I rushed into buying this book, but I'm not sure if I did the right thing <laughs> with that. I think Nina Power is just too early. She is already talking about reconciliation. Uh, she's talking about like maybe it's enough and maybe we should, you know, all live in peace and um, be good and kind to each other. Which is, you cannot not agree with that. Obviously, that's true. We should be uh, very respectful to each other. We should understand each other. We all have these problems in this capitalistic, uh, terrible world, blah, blah, blah. It's just I have this feeling that she's trying to make a peace treaty, but it just doesn't work. It's maybe too early because uh, feminism hasn't finished everything, let's say. The goals are not achieved yet. We still have a huge inequality. We still have, I don't know, uh, racism and uh, social differences. Unless we uh, change our perception or unless we change all this system and structure, we cannot be satisfied. We cannot just reconciliate and shake hands. That is just too early. 
maybe again maybe this time will never come maybe we will never reconciliate maybe it was always a fight in her final chapter she's, she's talking about reconciliation but i don't recall if she ever mentions reparations does one exist without another that's my personal question and uh um, unless we decided on like on philosophical level that yeah the re reconciliation is possible for example without any reparation then that's fine but for example if we take a look at the history of uh, war a history of nation no usually like an obligatory factor uh, in order to come to peace so and if we're talking about this uh, social differences and uh, different uh, social structures that should um, should come to peace we first, I think, should uh, talk about reparation, in my humble opinion. But yeah, Nina Power, thank you very much for your work. Uh, it is actually quite a small book. Uh, maybe you can finish like on, in a day or two. If you are interested in this discourse, uh, maybe you can pick it up uh, just to, you know, to see another opinion different from a majority of um, leftist literature. The next disappointment of 2022 is a novel by Elvia Wilk that is called Oval. So the reason why I picked that up is because uh, it is it takes place in Berlin, in, let's say, near future Berlin. And uh, there is this um, real estate crisis and uh, people, um, some of the people live in this experimental real estate. And so she describes the couple that um, I live in this uh, interesting building, a uh, very, let's say, sustainable uh, building, new kind of architecture. And um, yeah, I <laughs> actually dislike it because this story doesn't go anywhere. And sometimes they have uh, the conversation, for example, with their friends. Um, they, I don't know, trying to discuss work or where they work. And then some of the persons say, oh, I've got an NDA, like I'm non-disclosed, I cannot discuss that. And that's it. And uh, I would understand uh, you as an author mentioning NDA if you write describing our current condition. That is fine, because this is what actually a lot of people do in conversation. They say, oh, I got NDA. But this is an attempt to write some sort of science fiction like nearest future, what is going to happen with our ecological crisis. Yet she's using this NDA all the time and, uh, um, and, and it doesn't develop any story that way. Like uh, you can say, for example, oh, I have an NDA. But then, I don't know, the characters might get drunk altogether and just, uh, you know, split out everything and uh, tell and explain everything, which would be interesting, right? Because at the end, we want to know what they're doing, apart from, you know, having this crazy techno parties in Berlin and living in a very weird apartments. Some of the things she describes in this book felt a little bit anachromatic. For example, if we're talking about future and she mentions USB, um, I'm not sure if in the future we're gonna use USB at all. Like, even in the nearest future, even like in five years, we might got rid of it, you know? So yeah, I felt that the author didn't put, like, just a little bit of fantasy. Uh, I understand maybe USB is not, like, her main point, and maybe her focus was on something else, but it's just, it made you feel off a little bit. So it's really unfortunate I didn't enjoy this book as much as I could. I don't know, maybe I have some problem with science fiction, or maybe just it's just a bad example of science fiction. I don't know. But um, yeah, that's it for this book. And finally, the last one that was uh, very disgusting, actually, <laughs> is uh, Justine by the Marquise de Sade. Uh, I already talked uh, about this book in my like one of the previous videos. And uh, the reason why I read this book, I already mentioned that in one of my previous videos, is because I'm trying to read eroticism by Georges Bataille and this book or this author I would say uh, is mentioned in uh, that work so I thought yeah I maybe need to be acquainted with this uh, literary work as well and uh, it was uh, disgusting it was uh, disturbing I cannot recommend it to the people <laughs> um, but again if you um, maybe in your research maybe you're just personally interested in the subject of um, sexism, uh, patriarchy, 
um, how it is depicted in literature, how it is exploited indeed in the past. Um, maybe you can pick that up just, you know, as a reference. But for enjoyment, I, well, I can imagine there are some people that would enjoy this book. I don't want to meet those people, but yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that is uh, it for this video. I hope you enjoyed that and hope you had a great New Year celebration and uh, New Year holidays. If you're still there, keep doing great. And uh, yeah, let's see each other maybe sometime in the future. Bye-bye.